here's some reflections in Torah from Rabbi Elush in, in the spirit of elevating the neshama of uh, Rabbi Dean Steinzoltz, and not only elevating, but to, uh, to, take on, to take on some of his messages to heart uh, for our own learning and thriving and flourishing. And then after uh, that sharing, we will have the chance, I will ask a, a, a few questions, and then we will open the floor for questions, um, either by, uh, depending on the size of the group, either by unmuting yourself or by chat. Um, and so uh, with that spirit, we thank, we, 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 we thank Rabbi Elush for giving this time to share these reflections with us. And we also wish him comfort, given that this was uh, his very, very close Rebbe. Yeah. And um, we all know how amazing it is to learn from a gadol, uh, you know, a real, uh, a great master of Torah, but also how great it is to learn from them personally, as, uh, as Rabbi Elush did and as he continues to channel his to wonderful Torah into our community. So um, I think most of you know who Rabbi Elush are, but I know some of you on the call do not. And so um, he is the, um, the rabbi here in Scottsdale, Arizona of Beth Tefillah, uh, CBT, and um, has been here for probably about a decade now, I'm saying, thinking, eight, you know, about a decade or so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, uh, and is a mensch and a scholar and a dear friend and a great partner of us uh, here at, at Valley Beit Midrash. And we have many more people registered, but I see there's already 36 in the room. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rabbi Elush um, to share some, uh, share some wisdom with us. All right. Well, thank you, Rabbi Shmuley. It's always a pleasure being with you, my dear friend, and uh, with everyone here. I see so many familiar faces. It's really great to get together. I'm so happy we have this uh, technological ability to connect virtually, if not physically, and um, uh, that certainly is a great source of comfort and also of joy uh, to me and to so many others, especially when we come together for a greater purpose than ourselves really to learn from one of the great giants of this generation and dare I say of Jewish history. As you may know, Rabbi Steinzaltz uh, revolutionized the Jewish world by making the canon of the entire Jewish library available and accessible to all, regardless of whether you are a Jew or not, regardless whether you are knowledgeable or not. Rabbi Steinzaltz dedicated his life um, to make the Talmud first and foremost accessible. This was a 45 year project, which he uh, did and directed and spearheaded uh, every detail of it, almost single-handedly. He had no help for some 37 years. And then at, towards the very end, created a team of people who, who, who helped him reach the finish line. But he took this most complex work that is at the very backbone of Jewish literature, the Talmud itself that covers every topic and any topic under the sun from a Jewish lens and made it uh, accessible. First of all, made it comprehensible. It is in Aramaic, as many of you know, and its uh, way of, uh, its phraseology is very, very complex. It's an associative book that jumps from one topic to another. It has many seemingly primitive topics. Again, Rabbi Stanz with this tremendous genius uh, translated the Talmud into Hebrew, English, French, Spanish, Russian, many other languages, but also added his own commentary, which is an encyclopedic commentary, where you study not just the words of the Talmud, but you study the background. You study the biographies of the Talmudic sages mentioned. You study the maps, the diagrams. You study the botanical uh, facts on a plant, for example, that is mentioned in Talmud. So he made that uh, Talmud accessible. He made the Bible accessible with the same uh, strategy, same translation and commentary, and then uh, made the uh, books of Maimonides accessible, mainly his magnum opus, the Mishneh Torah, which is really the first code of Jewish law. He made the Tanya, one of the foremost Hasidic books on uh, philosophy, on Hasidic philosophy, he made that accessible. But beyond that, Rabbi Steinlitz was a man also who was himself accessible. He went uh, travel the world uh, to big cities like New York and to small cities like, uh, I forget the name, but somewhere in Siberia where there were maybe three, three Jews there and a very small community altogether, made himself, himself accessible, not to market himself, God forbid, not to uh, catch the spotlight, but quite the opposite, to ensure that through him, People connect to God, connect to Judaism, 
and connect most importantly to their souls, to their own Jewish souls. Uh, he did that and he was capable of doing that. Very few are capable of connecting to so many from so many different places, from so many different intellectual and cultural backgrounds. Rabbi Stanis was successful in doing that because he himself was a Renaissance man. He himself encompassed everything from uh, the most complex passages in Kabbalah, in Jewish mysticism, to the most sophisticated passages in the Talmud, to the most sophisticated areas of chemistry and philosophy. He himself had a PhD in chemistry and uh, philosophy in mathematics. He was a teacher of mathematics in zoology. He was a director of the Jerusalem Zoo. Board was there for a long time. Um, he really had the knowledge of the world available at his fingertips at all times. And because of that, he was really able to speak to the zoologist in his language, to speak to the scientist in his language, to speak to the Talmudist in his language, and to speak to the chief rabbi of Israel in his language. And um, uh, that, that really was the man, if I had to, to condense his bigger-than-life personality into just a few phrases. So thank yeah. you again for getting yeah. together and, and trying to access uh, some of his wisdom. To me, just uh, more personally, Nara Bashtanzalt was my mentor uh, for over 30 years. I had the great privilege of meeting him first time when he came to my, uh, uh, the town I was born in, to Toulouse, France, um, as a lecturer, as an invitee of the Jewish community. And uh, my father schlepped me to his lecture when I was seven and a half years old. And at the end of the lecture, I went to ask him, a question and Rabbi Steinsatz related to me as if I was the president of Israel and, and gave me all of the attention, all of the love that he could. He answered my question brilliantly also and it remained engraved. And it's as if I, our souls clicked. Some magic happened right there. And then even if I was just a tender young um, uh, boy, the age of seven and a half years old again, I felt this immediate connection with him. And then later on, you know, we moved to South Africa. From South Africa, we moved to Israel. At the age of 13 and a half, I was enrolled in his middle school, continued on in his yeshiva high school, Mekor Chaim, and then as, as sometime also in his post yeshiva high school. And that's where my relationship really developed with Rabbi Steinzalt. He, uh, our bond solidified. I saw him as not just a mentor that is wise and that gives good advice from time to time, but really as a spiritual father who guided me in every step of my life. And uh, with his guidance came so many tidbits of wisdom that uh, remain, remain with me until this very day. Um, now, Rabbi Steinsaltz also was uh, very involved in our community here in Arizona, dare I say. Uh, I really didn't take any, any decision, any major decision, uh, in the context of my community, Congregation Batefila, without his guidance. He visited us three times. He loved animals. I even took him to the wildlife zoo where he had such a good time. And uh, he was feeding the giraffes, <laughs> eucalyptus leaves, and he knew everything about every animal. It was really the experience, uh, the zoological experience of my lifetime, being with him uh, here at the wildlife zoo. I also had the privilege of being with him in, at the San Diego Zoo he was invited as a scientist, not as a rabbi, but as a scientist at the biggest scientist conference in the world that they have in different places every year, uh, the ASA, I think it's called. And um, he was there as a speaker and then he had a break and he told me, Pini, come, let's go uh, to the zoo. I hear they have a panda. I've never seen a panda in my life. So <laughs> we went to see the panda at the San Diego Zoo, but that wasn't of itself a great experience. And he had a life lesson from every animal from every plant, from every cactus he saw in the street, and from everything. And uh, just to summarize the short introduction about Rabbi Steinsaltz, and then um, I know Rabbi Shmuley, we can have the, the, the interview and the Q&A, but I, 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 I do want to leave you with this message. Speaking of this man who really was so connected to life, so connected to God in every atom of life, um, I, I'll, I'll share with you two quick anecdotes that hopefully we can take home with us. Um, both anecdotes happened when I visited him in New York City. The first anecdote is when I was walking with him in Times Square. And uh, he was going from one meeting to another. 
And as I'm sure you know, if you go to Times Square, uh, very rarely are you left alone. People attack you from every direction and they try and give you flyers on anything and everything under the sun, including very inappropriate flyers. Uh, and I don't have to elaborate. But Rabbi Schnauz is there walking with me and he grabs every single flyer that's given to him. And at one point I had to ask, <laughs> Rabbi, I can see the flyers they're giving you. They're as inappropriate as, as they can get. Why are you taking them? You don't need them. And he paused me and he, he looked at me with a very, very serious look and he said, you're right, Penny. I don't need them. But these people need me to take them. I said, what do you mean? He said, look, I know it works. These people are given amount, a very large amount of flyers to give out every single day. After they finish giving out those flyers, then they get their pay. So by taking a flyer from them, I help them get their pay a little bit quicker. Who knows if they're dependent on that pay for their lunch, for their dinner of the day. So why not help a stranger get his pay a little quicker? Why not help him with a little favor? But this showed me Rabbi Stanz's tremendous empathy and tremendous alignment with his purpose in this world. It was never about him, ever. He was the most humble man I've ever met. And I can tell you many stories about his humility. For example, a dear uh, lady from our community once asked him, Rabbi, a year Time magazine called you a once in a millennium scholar. How does it feel to be so wise? And he said, I don't know, but when I get there, I'll let you know. But he was a tremendously humble man and was never about it, but it was about what he can do for others, how he can be the best ambassador of God in this world. And as he was walking in the avenues of Times Square, he knew that he's not there for himself. He's there as a messenger of God. Even when you're a pedestrian, you can still do God's work. How? By helping a stranger in a way that most people can't even think of. But he did it right there and then. He did it at every moment of his life. That's anecdote number one. Anecdote number two, then we can begin the interview. And excuse me, Shwili, for this <laughs> long introduction. Oh, it's great. It's great. But in anecdote number two is when I was walking with him in a different part of New York, not far away from Central Park, and I shared this story at the tribute we had last week. But uh, all of a sudden, he stops and he looks at this magnificent American elm. I think it was an American elm, this beautiful tree. And he says to me, Penny, I want to share with you a little lesson. Look, there's three types of people in the world. The first type are the people that look by God's magnificent creation, that walk by God's magnificent creation, and they ignore it. They don't even pay attention to it. They're, they're just so locked up in the world, they can't see anything else. Type number two are the people who walk by God's magnificent creation, and they say, wow, this is beautiful. Thank you, God. But there's a type three. And the type three are the people who walk by God's magnificent creation. And not only do they say this is splendid, but they also say, I want a part of this creation. I want it in my backyard too. And they go and they pluck a leaf and they plant it in their backyard so that they can too take this magnificent and bring it home. And he said to me, look, I try to be part of that category number three. And I want you to be a part of that category number three. God's beauty is everywhere. So when you are touched by it, when you are wise enough to open up your eyes and see it, make sure that you take some of it and you plant it in your own backyard. You make it a part of your life. And in a way, I think this is really the purpose of us getting, getting together here today. And that is to look at Rabbi Ashtanza's magnificent tree and say to ourselves, not just, wow, this was a great man that lived in our generation. We were so fortunate. But really to say, how can I plant the little Steinsalz in my backyard? How can I learn from this giant of man and to become a little giant myself? That, I think, should be the purpose of this great gathering today. Very nice. Thank you so much. Sure. So, uh, so friends, I'm going um, to ask Rabbi Elish some questions. And feel free to post any questions or thoughts you have in the chat over there. Um, if you want, uh, if there's specific things you'd like to ask as well. So let me start here. Um, and thank you for that. That was really inspiring. Um, you know, so the Kutzka Rebbe famously taught that the, uh, that Avram Avinu, that Abraham never came off the, the mountain after the Akeda. 10 challenges, persevered, resilience. But that last one, it was just, he was, he was really done. He psychologically, spiritually never came off the mountain. 
And I think for most people that they won't get to 10. One life challenge, they're down for the count, which is fair. It's fair. Two, they're down for the count. Three, there's really nothing left in them, right? But, you know, and the people have different levels of perseverance, of, of, of resilience. Um, Rob Steindl's had his own challenges. Um, not for me to name them, but the, the most obvious publicly is our well, health challenges. And I wonder, what, what, is a, what is a little prescription for perseverance or for, or for resilience that Rob Steindl's might offer to people who either are current, current, currently struggling or have had a trauma that they've never really come off the mountain, so to speak, right? What is, what is something that he would offer someone um, as a spiritual guide towards uh, staying in the game, so to speak? That's a great question. So you're right. He did have his own challenges, and uh, there were many. He had the Gaucher disease. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. We needed dialysis once a month. He would go to the hospital, and Shara uh, Tzedek in Jerusalem, and be hooked onto this machine. Uh, dialysis. Uh, just imagine a man of his stature going to the hospital each and every month. Um, and he had many other challenges. He almost lost his life uh, um, when they found this, this tumor in his stomach. Uh, he had a 26-hour surgery in 1981. And the surgeons told him, you know, there's no guarantee that you're going to come out of this alive. But he had many medical challenges. He had other challenges. It's no secret also that he had opponents who burnt his books. You know, the, the fanatics of uh, Bnei Brak could not stand the fact that he was making the yeshiva world accessible to all when they thought they had, maybe they still think they have monopoly over it. And uh, he had many other challenges, but what's amazing about Ravash so maybe uh, I'll, we'll, we'll take a glimpse into two of his uh, characteristics, two of his insight that maybe helped him develop this, this resilience. Uh, number one is this idea that happiness and happiness through challenge is synonymous to um, uh, purpose fulfillment. If I am fulfilling my purpose, I'll become happy. Rabbi Stiles knew that his purpose was to help others uh, in his own way. And he dedicated his life to that. And in a way, each time I saw him face a challenge, I saw him almost elevate the dosage of, of vigor, of passion that he had towards his challenge in a way maybe to help himself remedy that harm, that pain that he was getting from the challenge himself because he knew that if I devote myself to my purpose, happiness will come, strength will come, and I'll be able to um, ride this wave. That's number one. The other thing I would say is that he also said that uh, to me, an, another type of definition regarding happiness and, and resilience, and that is that he said that the more a person is self-preoccupied, the sadder, the more depressed we'll become. The more we are other preoccupied, the, uh, the happier we'll become. And I remember him using the example of a young child. He said, look at a young child. A young child can fall 10 times, can get into seven fights a day, and yet he's happy. And he's going around as if the world is the happiest place to live in. Why? And he ex explained that's because a child is really never self-preoccupied. You ask a child, how do you feel today? He'll look at you as if you're Mars. What do you mean? I feel I'm busy living. Leave me alone. He's other preoccupied. And the more other preoccupied, the happier you become. And yes, challenges almost force us to look inward, to be self-preoccupied. But the remedy for them, at least the way he lived his life, was to not be sucked into the automatic mode that your psyche goes in when you face a challenge, that mode of self-preoccupation. Yeah. Like quite the opposite, fight the automatic mode and create for yourself an unnatural mode of going into the other preoccupation mindset. And in that way, you bring to yourself not just resilience, but also true happiness. Amazing, so amazing. Awesome. Yeah, and, I, and we see that all the time with pain. People whose pain leads to self-indulgence and people whose pain cultivates empathy. Um, also on this mission-driven uh, life, I think that's so important. You know, oftentimes when folks retire, some people view their retirement without, and I say this without critique, as a time of self-indulgence, a time finally I can relax. And, and, and that's, uh, I say without critique. And others who really become so radically other-focused 
in terms of how they think of mission. It's also true for people who are in, in the same life stage as you and I. And I like to call it the narcissism of family building, right? Family building, good idea, right? But those who check out from communal life, because they're like, my job right now is to make money and raise a family, but there's really nothing beyond that. And, um, and, and I think there's a depression that can emerge in, in that as well, because it, it becomes so, so, so toxically isolating um, and, and, um, and, and sort of a non-inspired form of, uh, of connection to broader community. So let me move to our next, our next yeah, question yeah. here. Let, yes, me, let me just clarify one thing. I was yes, really, I'm, I'm thinking about my words and, and I, might, I might be conveying an idea that Rabbi Schnauzer is very much against. Yeah. Because if, you, if you're not self-preoccupied and if you don't care too much about your feelings, which is really comes along with that idea, then you might say, oh, one second, Rabbi Schnauzer is so pathetic. Maybe he was ice cold. Maybe he was as dry of a man as it gets. Not at all. Actually, Rabbi Schnauzer is the most sensitive man. He's the most empathetic I've seen him cry many times just by telling an emotional story or just by trying someone else, just crying and crying and, and feeling that person's pain. So he wasn't pathetic or indifferent in any shape or form. Yeah. But what he was saying is that when it comes to own yeah. self-pity and to you, those feelings yeah. that come along with self-pity, then, then yes, there's no room for that. Then switch yeah. to that other preoccupation. Okay, moving from pain to growth. Um, what's his philosophy on teshuva? Those of us who want to grow, we want to evolve, we want to grow and evolve both flourishing within our own human potential, but we also want to grow and evolve in our relationship to the Rabboni Sholem, to the, to the creator, in our relationship to Torah and mitzvot. What's his philosophy of teshuva? As we know, the Musser, the, the Musser Nicks think we should have a Musser curriculum to develop our character. The mystics think about God consciousness, right? The rationalists think about the role of learning, right? All of these have elements of truth to them. But I wonder what, what was his sort of recipe or philosophy for, for those who want to engage in teshuva? So there's the philosophy of teshuva and then there's the deed of teshuva. And it's a great question. His philosophy of teshuva, by the way, he has a book called Teshuva. And I, I encourage everyone to, to read it. I have it right here in my office. But um, uh, this, this, his philosophy of teshuva was really what teshuva really means. Teshuva does not mean repentance. It means the return to the self. And, and the more aligned you are with yourself and with your self-purpose, uh, the more, the greater your teshuva will be, the greater the impact of that teshuva will also be. Um, that's the philosophy of teshuva. The, and then there was the deed of teshuva, and he would he would often quote. I remember him teaching this to us in high school. But you know, maybe the theme of teshuva can can be well encapsulated in a verse by King David uh, from the Book of Psalms that says, "Sur merav asetov." It's in the 30s. I forget exactly what what uh, chapter, but "Sur merav asetov," which means refrain from bad and do good. That's what. Teshuvah is really about that you accept upon yourself to refrain from bad and to doing good. But he would say this, there's two ways of reading this verse. I can hear his voice saying it as I'm saying it myself. He says one way is to say, which means refrain from bad, 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 and do good. The other way he said is my way. And then it's to read the verse, which means refrain from bad and do good, do good, do good, do good, do good. Where is the emphasis? Emphasis is not refraining from bad because very often when you refrain from bad, first of all, it gives birth to feelings like fear, like insecurity, like when you deal with, with in general, when, when bad occupies your mind, you can be sucked by it also. So Rabbi Shnau's philosophy was, okay, you know that you have to refrain from bad. That's an established fact. But now what do you do? So do good, do good, do good, do good, do good. And that eventually will rewire your entire being and you'll become a man of goodness. He, he often told me that you really uh, are defined by your deeds. The deeds define us. You know, Rene Descartes said, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. He disagreed with that vehemently. He would say, I do, therefore I am. The more you do good, the, the more your I am becomes good. Beautiful. So what did he have to say about this moment of pandemic? Um, for, uh, and, and this is a question that just came into me over here. Um, one, one part of the question is uh, the role of God. How do we think of the role of, 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 of God within uh, the pandemic uh, in terms of the origin? Um, and secondly, 
Uh, what do we do in response to it? There are those who say, what a great opportunity, stay home, you know, read more, connect with family more, like what a beautiful time to think about, about yourself and your family. There's others who say, no, no, you gotta get, go out and connect, you gotta reach with people. Um, what was Rav Steinzoltz's response to this pandemic? So the, the question was, what would he say about the pandemic? So I, I wanna evoke a story again, June 30th, 2014, I'm driving in the car with him in New York City and I get a phone call. And my brother's on the other line and he tells me, did you hear the news? I said, no. He said, look, I'm going to share with you the news, but I think you're going to have to share them also with Robert Steinzel. I said, fine, speak already. No. And he tells me um, the three boys were just found dead. Now, the background of the story, I'm sure you all know, is that in the summer of 2014, 18 days before June 30th, 2014, three young boys were kidnapped in Israel. Two of them, by the way, were students in Rabash Townsend's Mekor Chaim High School, where I also had the privilege to study. And uh, the entire world searched for them, right? You remember the story. And on June 30th, 2014, they found them abandoned, dead, abandoned in some field outside of Hebron. I'm, I'm shocked by the news. I pulled the car aside and I told Rabash Steinzaltz, look, I'm terribly sorry to be the bearer of sad news, but I have to share this with you. I said to him, uh, the three boys were found dead. And um, I know you'll probably have to go back to Israel. He had a few more days uh, to be in New York. And he did indeed go back to Israel immediately after those news um, were shared with him. But it was his reaction that told me everything about how to deal with uh, tremendous pain. First, he cried. He cried almost automatically. I mean, his face turned white and he cried unstoppably. Then he shouted the verse, Ura lama tishan Hashem. The verse also of the book of Psalms that says, Wake up, God, why are you sleeping? And the, the verse continues to say, Until when, God, will you treat your children like sheep that are being slaughtered? So there was a cry, not of resignation, but a cry of protest. It's wrong, God. You're not doing your job. And then, after a while, when he regained his emotions, he said to me, look, three beautiful Jewish souls were taken away from our world and they were taken away just because they are Jewish. It is therefore our duty now to add these three beautiful souls into our lives so that we can be, and then he said, Pini, you, don't, you, don't, you can't just live Pini's life. You have, to have, you have to live from now on Pini's life, Naftali's life, Gilad's life and Ayah's life, naming the names of the three boys. You have to take upon yourself even more. And in a way, I think that, that shared with me really his, his philosophy on how to deal with challenges. Challenges come, even pandemics come, and they force us to change our lives altogether. So first we can protest. We can say to God, this is wrong. Stop. I think that, by the way, is the, the, the goal of prayer altogether. That's what we do during the Amida prayer our most intimate prayer. We say to God, stop. This person is sick, give him uh, healing. This, uh, this parnasa is not going well. This livelihood is not uh, going well. Get the, fix it for me. We protest all the time. So I think it's just fine to shout out to God, especially during moments like this or, or, or months like weeks and months like these. But at the same time also, we have to draw a lesson. How can we become better beings? The, the, we can't thank God, that's impossible but we can draw a lesson from everything that God throws our way. And we have to try and draw personal lessons from this pandemic. Why, why is God doing this? We have to ask him to stop, but there must be a lesson in this. Maybe he wants us to be more family oriented. Maybe he wants us to value based. Maybe he wants us to shut off the noise and turn on the music within. Maybe that's the lesson. And that's what I think Rabbi Steinzoff would say. Um, thank you. Amazing. So one of the things that is not often so well known by folks who never spent time in yeshiva is that great scholars can oftentimes be um, a little bit mean spirited. And I say mean spirited, not God forbid, in any denigrating type of way. Um, but number one, they can be overburdened. Their, their phone is ringing off the hook at 10 o'clock at night, 11 at night, you know, post game, people who are getting questions from people. So they can be a little bit rough around the edges um, around things like this, over demanded. Uh, that's just human. But then there's another part that's intentional, where they view this as kind of molding students. 
right? Being a little bit tough with them, giving a little bit musr, giving a little shtuch, if you will, right? And so you, there's a little bit of a toughness. It's not just gentle. There's a loving fire there. And we don't think about this in communal life because a pulpit rabbi or someone in a role like mine, you know, you don't try to like give a little shtuch to your congregants, your community. You only speak gently. You'd lose your job if you talk, you know, you talk, you, know, you try to speak mean spirited. But in the yeshiva culture, it's a little different because you're more intensely trying to mold someone and there can be a mean spirited nature there. And again, mean spirit is almost the wrong phrase, but, 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 but a toughness with someone. And, and I wonder if, it, you know, um, if he had this side as well or if he had a different a different way, yeah. way he thought of molding students, yeah. So yes, he was actually known for that side of it. He oh, could really? be very harsh. He oh. could be very, very harsh. But as Aristotle famously said, it's easy to fly into an ecstasy. But to know when and how and why and what, that's much, much harder. So it's easy to fly into this type of musar that you're referring to and, and to attack people uh, when you see something that needs to be uh, rectified, especially if it's your own student. But it's, it's very hard you need to be a giant like Rabbi Steinsaltz to know exactly when and how, almost like a surgeon performing surgery. Yes, you know it's going to be painful, but if you're a good surgeon, you know exactly when to do it, how to do it, why you're doing it, so to ensure that the result is as optimal as possible. And I would say that was Rabbi Steinsaltz. He was known for his harsh side. And I could share with you personal stories of how she was with me. I remember when I was just an anecdote that comes to mind when I was maybe 15 years old, uh, you know, teenager that was a little rebellious. I came to ask for, we were having a Hasidic gathering where he would, you know, Hasidic gathering is when you sit around the table and, and he, he shares stories and lessons and so on. And I came between the breaks of between one talk and another. And I asked him a, a question about something in my life. And he said to me, Penny, I can't talk to you right now. I said, why? You want me to speak to you after the gathering, after the bringing? He said, no, I just can't talk to you right now because of the way you are. I said, what do you mean? He said, look, I can see through you and you have too many bugs occupying your mind. Get rid of those bugs and then come speak with me. <laughs> now, I took it very well. Sometimes it's true. I mean, he could share with me the greatest advice in the world. If I wasn't going to be spiritually receptive, spiritually in line with his message, and I, would have, I wouldn't have internalized it. And he saw it immediately. And, and he said it to me in a very, maybe harsh way, but in a very penetrating way that really shook me and, and caused me to make some changes. So, so he, he knew he was harsh and he could be very harsh. And I could tell you stories that you know, I, I've interacted uh, with him, but others that have interacted with him too, that I was a witness to him being very, very harsh. But he, he had this, this uncanny ability to know exactly what to say, when to say it, how to say it, so that it's as effective as possible. Mm. Mm. So um, thank you for that. <laughs> um, that's, you know, I'd love to hear more about that some other time. Um, so the, you are you because of, of you, because of your parents, because of your hard work, because of your learning, because of Hashkah Kapratis, because of divine providence. But I wonder, is there any part of who you are that you wouldn't be with, had, had he not been in your life? Um, you know, is there anything specific you would point to to say, like, this part of me really is that part of me because of him? Uh, it's a great question. I would say almost every, every spiritual part of me is there because of Robert Steinzeltz. I wouldn't be a rabbi. I would be an attorney. That's what I wanted to be. I, I wouldn't be a rabbi if not for Robert Steinzeltz. I wouldn't be dedicated to community work if not for Rabbi Steinzeltz. Uh, just to give you a glimpse into his genius, maybe two, two, two anecdotes, two very brief personal anecdotes to answer this question. One was when I was 18 years old. So I was in a yeshiva high school that's uh, aligned maybe with the Zionist movement. And um, that, that type of yeshiva really uh, create boys that have the full package. So they, they are big learners of Torah and of Judaism, but they also are, are big learners of secular studies. And we studied, you know, our day was from 6.45 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. So we packed in every possible subject into those um, hours of the day. And at the end, also, you also serve in the Israeli army. You're in Israel, so you serve in the Israeli army. My goal was to serve in an elite unit in the Israeli army. I trained for it. I, I, tried to, I tried my best to get into it. I went through the different tests in the Israeli army to do it. And at some point, uh, 
I needed to go through a medical examination. Now, I had to be honest with them and I told them, look, I have a genetic disease called FMF, familial Mediterranean fever, which is, by the way, a Jewish Sephardic disease. It's, thank God I'm completely healthy. I just have to take pills every day to prevent potential abdominal pains. I won't get too much into it, but Baruch Hashem, I'm healthy. Um, so I told them I have FMF. The, the medical examiners of the army say, say to me, sorry, you can't enlist in the army. Goodbye. In other words, you have the lowest profile, which means you can't even enlist in the army. Now, my life dream of serving in the Israeli army was shattered. Not only that, all my peers were going to the Israeli army. Now I'm like uh, the, the lone duck in the room. And I went to see Rabbi Stowns. I didn't know what to do. And Rabbi Stowns said to me, well, why don't you go to Geneva? I said, what? Never been. Geneva? I said, yeah, you speak the language, you speak French, and I hear that they need a youth leader there. Now, community work was the furthest thing from my mind. Going out of Israel was the furthest thing from my mind. And, and uh, an opportunity so far in Geneva, like a culture that I never encountered before. Yet he had that, that, Walton Chong, to, to, to see everything. I went to Geneva, I started working with the communities and something in me clicked, resonated deeply. I said, okay, maybe that's what I need to do. And uh, slowly but surely, I started becoming interesting, interested in becoming a rabbi and, and the rest is history. But it was Rabbi Stelz's tremendous vision that created that. Amazing. Anecdote number two is, yeah. is, is separate. It happened about 13 years ago, but I was going through a very tough time. Uh, rabbinically, my rabbinic position, my, uh, some of you may know, but the community that was a rabbi of year in Congregation Batavilla collapsed, it was, no, less than 13 years ago, 10 years ago, um, uh, because of the real estate crash and all sorts of other reasons. And um, some families came together and said, let's create Congregation Batavilla, which is exactly what we did. Uh, eventually, but I had proposals in Seattle and in Hong Kong, which was considered to be a very prestigious position. Uh, they pay very well. It's one of the most influential Jewish communities in the world. And uh, I was chosen to, um, out of a pool of 80 rabbis, to serve as their rabbi. And Rabbi Stanz is the one who really uh, orchestrated almost everything for me. If you go apply, uh, these camps and you go there for Shabbat when they invite you and you do this and you say this for Torah and and uh, you'll you'll do it okay fine finally I'm offered the position after all these tests I said Rabbi Stanz okay should I go now he said no stay in Phoenix now Phoenix was in <laughs> was not even you know was in 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 crumble I mean uh, we had nothing everything was destroyed yet for us and to, to create a new also something that I didn't quite think of, stay in Phoenix. I said, so then why did you make me go through all this Hong Kong thing? And he said to me, I just wanted you to know what you're worth. And he told me something tremendous that sometimes, you know, you go through a tough time in life and it starts affecting you and you start beating yourself up and you say to yourself, well, maybe I'm not worth anything. And he was an incredible mentor who saw that in me. And he revived my worth, my, my sense of self in a way that no one else could have. So here are two anecdotes that show you just the type of influence Amazing. he had on me yep. and uh, on my community here in general. And we're grateful to that. We're grateful that you yeah. stuck here. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank sure. you, Steinsoltz. Okay, here's a question that just came in also. Tell us about the Rabbitson. Tell us about Rabbitson Steinsoltz. She's a very, very special woman. Number one, because she's French. And I'm French. <laughs> so I'm joking. But um, she comes uh, from a very Hasidic family, a Chabad Hasidic family. Azimov is also the cousin, first cousin of Isaac Azimov, the famous scientist who Robert Stowns had a deep relationship with too. Um, she comes from an illustrious and scientific family. Um, she herself is a very strong woman. But I would say that she knew that when she was marrying Rabbi Steinsaltz, she was marrying someone who is a trailblazer, who's going to change the world. And she made a conscious decision, as she told me, by the way, I have a very close relationship, Sarah is the name. And she told me that she knew that she was going to sacrifice everything for her husband and for his, not for him personally, but for his uh, work, for his divine work in this world. 
and she was just fine with it. To give you a short example, Rabbi Steinsatz would not sleep. You know, when I wanted to speak to Rabbi Steinsatz, which I did many, many times, I knew that the best time to catch him when he was calm and calculate or not busy with a thousand meetings and work, it was at three o'clock in the morning. I knew that he was then at his office and I could speak to him when he was in a, in a more calmer setting. And uh, he would go home really every day at about 4 a.m., sleep for maybe two, three hours, get up, pray, and then continue with his day. Now, she would wait for him every single night at 4 a.m., would not go to sleep until her husband came. The, 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 not only does this shout dedication, unfathomable dedication, but this also shows, gives us a glimpse into the type of uh, woman she is, Robertson she is. Very nice. Um, so his response to modernity, let's have two polar extremes. Let's say a progressive response to modernity is such that the new is the best. Innovation, new trends, we want new novelty, right? The new is the best. And a, a super conservative approach is the new is trafe, right? We, wanna, we want the old, the old is true. It's closer to Sinai, it's closer to creation. This is true in politics, this is true in religion. Right. So what's his response to modernity in terms of what to, how do we respond to the new and to give three uh, potential test cases which you can engage or not engage. One would be feminism. We're very aware. Yesterday was 100 years since women's suffrage in America or white women's suffrage, we should say, in America. So there's feminism. And of course, different denominations respond different to this notion of, of egalitarianism. There's universalism, the notion that we're tribes, but we're all part of humanity. And then thirdly, we might say Zionism. Zionism as a modern ideology. Obviously, the connection to Israel is, is ancient, but at the modern Herzl ideology, which we call today Zionism. What's his response to the new? So I'll, I'll respond with another anecdote. So I remember being with him um, in Chicago and being interviewed by um, this massive, I forget, this massive TV channel. And um, of course, they needed to make up him and all of that. And I told him, look, Rabbi Stanz, maybe you, you want to change your shirt. He had this shirt that was very old and, and a little uh, stained. Um, so he was getting frustrated. <laughs> and he said, fine, I can do what you want. But then it won't be me speaking. It will be <laughs> someone else speaking. If I were to remain true to myself, and if you want to interview Rabbi Stanz, then just let me be. And uh, in a way, I think that gave me a glimpse into his general approach. His general approach was, yes, TV channel, go to the world, engage yourself as much as possible, jump on every occasion you have to make a dent in that part of the world. You God sent you to this world to impact this world, but don't lose yourself in the process. Be engaged with the world, but remain true to your deeper self and let that deeper self impact the world, not the person that you become not some external shell of yourself. That, and, and in a way, I think that was his approach. Rabbi Stanz was, very, you know, speaking of, his, uh, of the way he dressed, I mean, if you saw, look, I have a picture of him here in my office. He doesn't look like the most mo modernized rabbi, quite the opposite. <laughs> he looks like he emerged from the 18th century um, uh, from somewhere in Poland. But, uh, and by the way, his ancestors were Polish, but, but yet he, really, I, 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 I met very few scientists who had the level of knowledge in science that he had, very few zoologists who had the level of zoology that he had. He, he, he was a walking encyclopedia in so many ways because he understood that God created us in this world to be in the world. But you also have to be in the world to your true self. You can't allow that true self to be affected by the world. Or as he would tell me, be the influencer, not the influencee. When you bring your true self and you make that self influence the world, then you can be in the world yet remain above it. And that was his general approach to modernism. Now, uh, in feminism and the other notions and ideologies that you know. I, I, I said, think, uh, yeah, feminism, universalism, and, and Zionism. Right. So feminism, I think he, he was a big proponent of feminism, especially in the uh, Jewish world. By opening the gates of the Talmud, he opened them to women. And um, he was uh, time again begging women who, who, for whatever reason, were hesitant to study Torah, to go and study Torah. I remember attending maybe the longest class in history ever to take place. It was Rabbi Stanz's class. 
uh, he would give a class every Thursday night. He was so dedicated to it that even during the engagement of his own son that took place on a Thursday night, he left the engagement to teach and then come, he came back to the engagement. But he held this class for about 45 years, 45 years. It started with the president of Israel, Shazar. He was giving that class when he was about 20 years old and professors at Hebrew U, and it took many different forms, but he gave this class each and every week consistently on the Thursday night. And I remember attending those classes, and I remember being quite inspired by the idea that most of the students there were women, not men. Now, go see a rabbi that looks best, teach a class to mainly women. I don't think you find many of those in the world. So he was a, a big component of feminism in the sense that uh, women in Torah as much as possible, he would mock the fanatics who do not let women study Torah by saying that uh, I think there is the real reason they don't uh, let them study Torah because they're afraid. They're afraid that once they study Torah, they'll be wiser than them. And they'll start telling them that they not rush a kitchen and they're not doing this, not doing that. So they're afraid and therefore uh, they don't let them study. So that's feminism. Universalism, I think I mentioned that. He was a man of the world, a man who not only uh, knew that the whole world impacted, but he worked to impact the entire world. Uh, he interacted with Jews and non-Jews alike. He um, has um, honorary doctorates from so many universities, was a uh, uh, scholar in residence in Princeton, Yale, you name it, many of the, Oxford, many of the Ivy League uh, universities. Um, so he impacted the world on that level, on that scholarly level. But he, I would say he also impacted the world on a very, um, uh, lowly level uh, and he would interact with janitors in the street in Jerusalem and try to impact them in that way and I remember again traveling the world with him never to America I would try and go visit him because I knew that the opportunities were few and I've been with him to Memphis to Chicago to San Francisco to New York to Miami to, to many cities here in America and what is amazing to me is his ability to connect to everyone whether it's the passenger sitting next to him on the plane or someone that he just bumped into the street or the barista at Starbucks. He would always try and connect, not just to be polite and be nice, but really to make an impact. And that's the level, that's, that's the idea of universalism that, that he saw. And last but not least, Zionism. So um, he once defined, and really to give a brief, because we can speak about his ideology on Zionism for a very long time, it was very complex. But to answer this very briefly, I, I once asked him, uh, what does he think about um, the peace process, what, what's happening in Israel, and so on and so forth. He said that uh, the problem is that we're allowing politicians to define what Zionism is, when Zionism really should be defined by religious leaders. If we can solve this issue religiously, if an imam can meet a rabbi and solve this issue religiously, it would be religious. Why? Because Zionism is a religious idea. It's, a, it's an idea that's prevalent in the Torah. Now, what type of Zionism and so on, but it should be led by, by religious leaders, not by himself would meet with imams and, and it would be very controversial sometimes, but he did it because he understood that there needed to be a fundamental change, not just a political, nice, fluffy, uh, polite type of change, a fundamental change, which is in essence divine and dare I say religious Torah based. He understood that and he worked for that too. That's the type of Zionism he wanted to see. So um, if I had a free day, I'm still waiting for a free day, but if I had a free day, I would spend it reading books and uh, opening Sfarim and things that I, maybe you would do with a free day also. <laughs> um, and, and, and someone like Rose Steinzel, someone who is just, a one, you know, like you said, once in a lifetime, once in a century, once in a uh, whenever scholar, uh, he was also an institution builder. And so scholars hate, oftentimes hate building institutions because they want to do scholarship. You don't want to fundraise and manage and, and do all the things that are involved with, with that. And so how did, how did he think about institution building work? Um, is that something he hated and he, re and he delegated to others? Is that something he found meaningful? How did he think about building a yeshiva, building educational institutions? So in a way, I think you just hit the nail on the head because that was the enigma of Rabbi Steinzeltz. You know, Winston Churchill said about Stalin that he's an enigma, a riddle wrapped in an enigma, I think, something like that. I think in a way, Rabbi Steinzeltz was a riddle wrapped in an enigma in that sense because he was a man of the heavens, yet he was deeply steeped in, 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 the, in this planet, in earth. And he was a man who was very professorial, like you just said, 
yet he understood the importance of infrastructure and institutions and so on. And he was able to do both. How? I really don't know. But I will say maybe something that helped him at least create those institutions. As you pointed out, he was a delegator. He was not a micromanager in any sense of the world. He wanted an army of generals, not an army of soldiers, as he often said. Uh, he would say, I don't want you to be a soldier, I want you to be a general. In what domain, you, you'll decide, whatever's in line with your purpose. But he wanted to create an army of generals. And once he found generals, he would say, okay, you lead this institution, you do this for me, you do that. And in a way, I think that's how he managed to bridge that impossible gap. Beautiful. Okay, here's a, here's a last question for you, and we'll call it a day. And um, sure. we're, as we're approaching Elul later this, uh, this week, and we're approaching Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, what, uh, what, what, what charge would he give us? What bracha would he give us? What, what is our work right now to do um, as we uh, work towards our refinement and growth? Right. So on the macro level, I'll give an anecdote, and then on the micro level, I'll give another anecdote. On the macro level, I have a friend who told me last week, he was also the student of Rabbi Steinzeltz, that he once came to Rabbi Steinzeltz on his birthday to ask him for a blessing. Now, you would expect a typical rabbi to give a blessing for good health and happiness and success and whatever else. Rabbi Steinzeltz was not the typical rabbi, and he calculated every word he said, and he was uh, really uh, yearning to make an impact through his words and through his actions uh, with, with every encounter and in every encounter. So uh, he comes, this man, this young student comes to Rabbi, give me a blessing for my birthday. Rabbi Stein says to him as follows. I bless you that when you celebrate your birthday next year, you'll be so positively transformed that you won't recognize yourself. You'll be so positively transformed that you won't recognize yourself. Mm. In a way, that's what Teshuvah, that's what Elul was, is about in the eyes of Rabbi Steinzel, to transform ourselves so positively, to allow that inner self to emerge so, so uh, brilliantly, so radiantly, that we don't recognize ourselves anymore. There's so much light. Wow. That's macro level. On the micro level, I'll quote yet another statement, one that became famous, especially after his passing by Rabbi Steinzel. And he would say this, my goal in life is to infect people to move a step forward. I remember being with him in a big celebration and uh, he took the microphone and he said, I really don't care whether I go to heaven or to hell when I die. I don't care whether they, um, what they'll put on my tombstone. What I do care about is whether I infected people and caused them to take one step forward in their own spiritual journey, each in their own way. That's what Rabbi Stans would want us to do in the context of the Shuva to take one step forward. Think of a mitzvah that you never thought of performing and take it upon yourself. Come out of your comfort zone and do it. Think of a Torah study that you never thought of learning, that you never thought of engaging into and do it. Take upon yourself that class at VBM or at your congregation or anywhere else. But go, come out of your comfort zone and do that. Because as Rabbi Steinzels would say, and I'll conclude with that, that when one person make, uh, takes one step forward, a good thing happens in the world. But if a million people take one step forward, the whole world shakes. And we want the whole world to shake and usher in the ultimate redemption. Amen, amen. Thank you, Rabbi Alush, for opening up your, st your story, your soul, these teachings in such an inspiring way, incredibly rich. And uh, thankfully, we have you here in town to continue to learn from you and continue to hear these stories and, and, and others. Nice. And friends, uh, we, yeah, we give you this bracha that we should all continue to flourish and grow and learn and uh, actualize our unique potential and cling to great people. You know, this world is, uh, there's greatness within everyone, um, and, but there are also people who are really uh, great people for what they're committed to in their lives and our, our, our opportunity to cling to them. So thank you, Rabbi Lush. Thank you all for joining us. Tomorrow at 11, we'll be learning with Rabbi Zach Truboff in Israel around Sadaka, different philosophical approaches to Sadaka at 11 o'clock. And um, for those of you who knew Rabbi Micah Kaplan, who served here in town, we're doing a rabbinic tribute program to him on, um, on Monday at 1 o'clock. And uh, Rabbi Elush was actually close to him. He's not able to join, but he's had other spaces to offer tributes. Um, and so we've got about 10 rabbis who are going to share some, uh, some words of Torah in his memory as well. 
Thank you all so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Rabbi Shmuley. I want to thank you for the thank you. Thank you for honoring Rabbi Stanz in such a way. And thank you all for coming together. It's always a pleasure learning with all of you and growing with all of you. We're all, we're all in this together. This recording will be available. You can share this recording with others if you'd like. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank, thank you so much. You.